Good morning, morning church. church. Good morning, church. Morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning, church family. Good morning, Christ Church. Good morning, 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 church. Good morning. Welcome to Christ United Methodist Church Online. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We hope that you are blessed by the service and we can't wait to see you face to face. On behalf of the congregation, we welcome you, we bless you, and we behold the Christ in you. Please join me in the call to worship. We come with hearts bowed and bodies bent shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Just like blind Bartimaeus did, just like the lame and oppressed did, let us have the courage to ask as Jesus asked, what do you want Jesus to do for you? God, call us and use us for your glory so that others can be healed in Jesus' name. Please join me in singing the opening hymn. The lyrics will appear on the screen. Please pray with me. Holy One, still us this day to encounter your presence in our worship and in the world. Ready us to hear your voice as it speaks to us in ways that are sometimes dramatic, often ordinary, and always meaningful. 
Help us also to hear you through each other and especially through those whom we sometimes in busyness or in pride forget to listen to. Amen. Our first scripture reading will be taken from the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Jesus and his followers came to, into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho, together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet, but he shouted even louder, son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and said, call him forward. They called the blind man, be encouraged, get up, he's calling you. Throwing his coat to the side, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, teacher, I want to see. Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see and began to follow Jesus on the way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If your children are not already around the computer, I invite you to give them the best seat in the house. This is their special time. Let's sing where children belong as they get settled. Good morning, young disciples. I hope that you had a wonderful Easter last Sunday and that you remember that Easter is not just about Easter egg hunts, Easter baskets, and receiving chocolates and jelly beans. Easter is about Christ rising from the tomb, full of life and power. Now, I realize that I haven't read to you in a while. And so this morning, during our time together, I'd like to read you a story about a scrawny cat. I just want to warn you that at the beginning of this story, it's a little sad, but it gets better. The title of this book is Scrawny Cat. It was written by Phyllis Root and illustrated by Allison Friend, and it was published by Candlewick Press. The word scrawny, in case you don't know, means very, very thin. He's very thin because he's hungry. And look at that sad face. Oh my. My heart breaks for the scrawny cat. A scrawny cat crept down the street. He was lonely and he was a little lost. He had belonged to someone once and she had belonged to him. Someone who picked him up and scratched his ears and let him lick her chin. Someone who knew his name. Now, everyone called him, get out of here. But the scrawny cat knew his name was not, get out of here. The wind hurried the scrawny cat along. He hunkered down in a doorway where good smells drifted out. Maybe someone would let him inside and give him something warm to eat. But when the door opened, a man yelled, get out of here. So the scrawny cat bolted down the street, straight into a big dog. Grrr, growled the dog. The skittery scrawny cat raced away, all the way to the dock. Grrr, growled the big dog right behind him. What else could the scared little scrawny cat do? He leaped into the dinghy just as kaboom, rain pummeled down and the big dog ran away. 
the scrawny cat huddled under the dinghy seat. Up and down, up and down, the dinghy rocked on the waves, just the way someone used to rock the scrawny cat. In a chain, the tuckered out scrawny cat put his head on his paws and fell asleep. The wind blew, the waves crashed, the rope tying the dinghy to the dock snapped. When the scrawny cat woke up, all he could see was water, water everywhere. Poor shivery scrawny cat. He left the rainwater in the bottom of the dinghy and wished his stomach didn't chew so on his ribs. At last, the sun came up, golden across the waves up ahead. Just where the boat was headed, the scrawny cat saw a rock and a tree and a house on the sand. A woman came out of the house. She had been a sailor once, but her ship had crashed on the rocks. She had built a little house for herself and settled down to catch fish and gather seaweed and pick berries. But sometimes she missed sailing the open sea and all by herself, she got a little lonely. Now she came down to the shore to see what the storm had blown in. The scrawny cat hunched down under the dinky seat. Would the woman throw things at him and call him get out get out of here the dinghy grated on the sand the woman reached down and picked the scrawny cat up how did you get way out here all by yourself the woman said you must be quite the sailor cat the woman took the scrawny cat inside her house she rubbed him dry with a towel and put a bowl of fish stew on the floor. The scrawny cat lapped up the stew until his stomach was round and full. The woman picked him up again. Would she throw him out the door? Not at all. She sat in the rocking chair and scratched the scrawny cat's ears. I've been wanting some company, the woman said, and here you come, sailing in like a regular skipper. The scrawny cat purred. Skipper, that's what I'll call you, the woman said. I'm Emma. Skipper purred even harder and licked Emma under her chin. If you were lucky enough to go sailing someday far out to the sea, you might see them together, Skipper and Emma. Skipper isn't scrawny anymore. He's a real sailor cat now. But best of all, Skipper belongs to Emma and Emma belongs to Skipper. The end. In our scripture, Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus for mercy. And when he's hushed by the crowd, he just gets louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Let me see again. Bartimaeus believes Jesus can restore his sight. Jesus responds to his faithful persistence by healing him. Like Bartimaeus, the scrawny cat hopes for restoration of a life he once had. Like Bartimaeus also, Scrawny Cat is hushed by those around him. And like Bartimaeus, Scrawny Cat has faithful persistence and eventually it pays off. As the story ends, he is no longer scrawny, no longer nameless, and his sense of belonging has been restored. And just as Bartimaeus was able to take his problems to Jesus for help, so can we. It doesn't have to be something huge like blindness. It can be the small everyday problems that we all face, 
like getting frustrated when things don't go our way, or the hurt feelings that we feel when someone yells at us or calls us a name that doesn't belong to us. Like, get out of here. Jesus wants us to tell him what we want and need so that he can respond, and that is good news for us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for our young disciples. We thank you, O oh Lord, that as they cry out for your help, that you are ever present, ever listening, and ever willing and desiring to step in on their behalf. We pray, O oh Lord, that as they continue to grow in both age and wisdom, that you would be with them, that you would guide them and lead them and provide for them all that they need to be whole. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks, now and forever. Amen.
God creates, knows, loves, and sees all of us in our full humanity. But as people, we can fall into the habit of assuming that everyone is the same or everyone is just like us. While we share a common humanity, these assumptions can be harmful and prevent us from truly seeing other people and listening to their perspectives. By looking at the biblical stories, this series will help us to learn how to listen to, repeat, respect, affirm, and act for and with others. In doing so, we can also come to know God even more fully. This week, we begin a new sermon series, I See You, with a sermon titled, Hearing Other Voices. I would like to warn you that this week we will deal with adult themes. Parents, please know that parental discretion is advised, and if you, are some, you or someone you know needs help with issues of addiction, sexual abuse, or incest, links to helps are attached to this sermon, as well as resources to help parents talk with your children about these issues. Would you please pray with me? God of all who doubt and believe, by the gift of your spirit, enable us to hear with our ears, to see with our eyes, and to touch with our hands your word of life, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. Amen. God creates, knows, loves, and sees all of us in our full humanity. But as people, we can fall into the habit of assuming everyone is the same or everyone is like us. While we share a common humanity, these assumptions can be harmful and prevent us from truly seeing other people and listening to their perspectives. By looking at biblical stories, 
This series will help us learn how to listen to, respect, affirm, and act for and with others. In doing so, we can also come to know God even more fully. I see you. Hearing other voices. When I was fresh out of seminary, I had the privilege of working at the historic Concord Baptist Church of Christ in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the neighborhood, if you have watched any Spike Lee movie, you have seen Bed-Stuy, as it is affectionately called. If you have listened to the music of the notorious B.I.G., you have heard stories of the infamous neighborhood. And as Biggie was known to say, Bedford Stuyvesant is the livest one. And Bed-Stuy was live. It was a neighborhood that had never fully recovered from the loss of industry as companies fled the inner cities in the late 60s and early 70s. This neighborhood endured decades of neglect, a crack epidemic that destroyed the fabric of the neighborhood along with the lives of many of its residents during the 80s and the 90s. And by the time I arrived in 2010, it was a shadow of its former glory. While working at Concord, it was not uncommon for residents of the neighborhood to come to the church to request financial assistance. It was, in fact, such a common occurrence that I began to dread the call that would come from the office, informing us that there was someone there who wanted to speak to the pastor. Whenever I would get the call, my stomach would automatically tie up in knots. What would this person want or need, I worried. What horrible story of pain and deprivation would I hear before I got the big ask? I dreaded these calls, and I must admit, because I wanted to help everyone who crossed the threshold of the church, the truth of the matter is that the need was too great and the resources too limited to really make an impact. And if I'm totally honest, I had become jaded. I had heard too many stories of job loss and rent due, babies without pampers or food to eat, electricity shut off, need of money for transportation to government offices, and just plain old requests for money that I thought would most probably be used for drugs or alcohol. I had become jaded. And if I am going to be totally honest and tell the whole truth today, I did not want to listen or hear any more requests that I could not fulfill. One morning, while working in my office, I received a call from the church secretary that we had a walk-in that requested to speak to the pastor. <sighs> Immediately, knots formed in my stomach. It had become my experience, like I said, that most walk-in requests for the pastor inevitably ended with requests for monetary assistance and while I certainly don't begrudge the request, I often came away from the experience feeling inadequate and unable to fully meet the needs of those who came to me. Because as a church, the decision was made before I got there that we would not give cash, but instead offer food cards or Metro cards for transportation. As I walked down the long hallway towards our guest, my mind was swirling with concerns and fears that I would be unable to meet the need. On this day, 
I did not have to concern myself with that. As I approached the vestibule, I was met by a woman of indeterminate age, possibly in her 30s or 40s, clean and tidy in appearance, but certainly with the look and the smell of current or past drug abuse problems. My stomach nodded again. Certainly, this would be a request for money, I thought. And that reminds me of our scripture lesson for this morning. The healing of Bartimaeus comes as the climax to the entire first half of Mark and at the completion of Jesus' final trek to Jerusalem. The very next event in this story in Mark is Jesus' triumphal entry into the city. For most of that trip, Jesus had been emphasizing what it means to be his disciples. Peter didn't get it. It was with his refusal to accept that Jesus must die on the cross. The rich young man didn't get it with his turning sadly away because the cost of discipleship was too high. The Zebedee brothers, James and John, didn't get it with their desire to be at his right and left hand when Jesus comes into his kingdom. But here in Jericho, just as Jesus enters the final step of his journey to Jerusalem, here's someone who gets it. The significance of Bartimaeus is surely that he demonstrates the characteristics of a disciple. The 12 are denying Jesus' mission and vying for power. The rich young man makes a fatal choice to keep his money rather than follow Jesus' call to give it all away and follow him. But Bartimaeus unashamedly calls out to Jesus and begs for mercy. And as Bartimaeus calls out for help from the master, can you believe that the people around Jesus actually told him to be quiet? Hush, they said, or rather, shut up. No one wants to hear all that caterwauling. There is tremendous social pressure to stifle the cries of human pain and neediness. When people sink deeply into grief, they often hear the message, just get over it. When the poor and homeless make their presence known, society wants to make them invisible. When victims cry out for justice, they are often told to just take whatever this is and move on. When people commit crimes and seek mercy to rebuild their lives, society chooses to lock them up and throw away the key. But Jesus stood still and said, call him here. Jesus' ears are especially attuned to hear the cries for mercy whenever and wherever they may be voiced. We are all beggars after all. We have no claim on Jesus other than that we are in deep and desperate need of his mercy. And isn't it ironic that the very people who were blessed, healed, and even saved by Jesus are the same ones who want to keep this blind man from his blessing, his healing, and his salvation. When Bartimaeus makes it to Jesus, Jesus asks an interesting question. What do you want me to do for you? After introducing myself and asking how I might help her, I was surprised by her response. I just want someone to confess to. Okay, this is a new approach. I showed her to the lounge where we would have privacy and tried to make her feel at ease. She was noticeably anxious, but it seems she was also determined to free herself of some burden. She shared that she was a member of a church in the neighborhood, but that she did not feel 
that she could confess to her pastor or her fellow members. She felt guilty that after so much of their care and so much love that they had showered her with, she had had a relapse and had begun smoking crack after a year and a half of sobriety. But this was not what she wanted to confess. As I continued to listen, she shared that she was sexually molested as a young child by her pastor. At this point in her confession, she began to cry, softly at first, but with a steady stream of tears. I immediately told her that I was sorry that that had happened to her, and I offered her tissues. I asked how old she was when it took place. She said she was nine. I asked if she told anyone at the time of the molestation. She said that I was the first person that she had ever shared this with. But this was not what she had to confess. As she continued to cry softly, she said that she had also been involved in an incest thing with her brother. I nodded and asked how old she was when that took place. She was 12. And after a pause, and how old was your brother? He was nine. At this point, her soft cries turned to heart-riching sobs. I nodded and offered her more your tissues. I asked if I could touch her. She nodded and I placed my hand on her knee. I waited several moments and asked her if that was what she needed to confess. She said that it was, and that she had carried around the guilt for what she had done to her brother for 30 years, which was why she began to use drugs and to sell her body all those years ago. She shared that every time she would get her life together, an inner voice would remind her of what she had done and accuse her of not being worthy of a good life, insisting that she somehow did not deserve to be happy after what was done to her and what she had done to her brother. I reassured her that regardless of what happened with her brother, when she was a child herself, she deserved to be happy and to enjoy a good life. I asked her if she had confessed to God and asked for forgiveness. She said that she had over and over and over again. I assured her that God had forgiven her. I asked her also if she had apologized or sought forgiveness from her brother. She shared that she had not, and that she had not spoken to him in the 10 years since their mother's death. I encouraged her to try and do so, and to consider forgiving herself. I told her that it seemed to me that she had already tried, convicted, and sentenced herself to a life of imprisonment, to drugs and self-abuse because of what she'd done as a child. And I encouraged her to tell her church of her relapse so that they might be able to help assist her as she attempted to stop using. I also offered her a listing of the NA and AA meetings in our area and I asked if she would be interested in speaking to a professional to work with her as she resolved these issues that stemmed from the abuse she had suffered as a child and the guilt that resulted from her perpetrating against her brother. She declined, but I encouraged her to return to the church if she changed her mind and I would, in, I would assist her in identifying a available resources. I prayed with her, and I asked if there was anything else that I could do. She said no. All she wanted was to confess. Sometimes we believe we already know what people want and need. 
we decide for ourselves upon seeing them or their condition what would be best for them. But what God is trying to teach us through the question and response of Jesus is that it is not our place to decide what others need, but instead to listen and hear their needs from their mouths. Jesus could have assumed that because Bartimaeus was a beggar, that what he wanted from Jesus was money. Instead, just like the woman who visited the church looking for a pastor to confess, Jesus knew that by hearing from Bartimaeus, he was doing more than fielding requests from a needy person. He was engaging in conversation. He was offering an opportunity for relationship, and he was extending friendship. Because, like my visitor in Brooklyn, Bartimaeus did not want money. He wanted freedom from the yoke that tied him to misery. He wanted to be restored to his former self before the blindness, before the begging, before the banishment to the margins of society. Bartimaeus wanted more than his sight. He wanted restoration to community. There are people in our social circles right now who are calling out from the side of the road. They are calling us by name. Christ Church, Church of God, have mercy on me. Will we assume that we know what they want? Will we give them what we believe they need? Or will we follow the example that Jesus so effectively modeled and engaged in by listening to them? Will we do more than fill a temporary need and offer the greatest of gifts? Conversation, relationship, and friendship. The text tells us that after receiving his sight, Bartimaeus immediately followed Jesus along the road. He became a disciple of Christ, all because someone stopped what they were doing and listened to him. Amen. Please join me as we pray the prayers of the people. Living God, giver of life, hear us as we pray, saying, pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. We pray for the church. Let your church be a living sign of the woundedness and healing of Christ, sharing the gift of forgiveness and the gospel of reconciliation. Pour out your blessing, O Lord, send us your peace. We pray for the earth. Help us to see the scars of death that mark your good creation and to seek the blessing of life that you offer to all creatures. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. We pray for all nations. Show us how good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity and anoint us with your wisdom so that we may seek the ways of life. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. We pray for this community. Give us a vision of the common good not clinging to our own possessions, but seeking the fullness of life for all as a testimony to Christ's resurrection. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send your spirit of peace. We pray for our loved ones.
Be near to those who walk in darkness and lead us all into Christ's light so that our fellowship may be true and our joy may be complete. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. By the blessings of your spirit, help us to live as we pray so that, we, so that the world we come to know the gift of life in Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We get so focused on doing things the right and proper way that we tend to forget that God sometimes speaks to, uh, speaks to us in quiet and ordinary ways. Today, may we open our eyes to witness the many places of need around us, the places of loss, loneliness, of grief, of pain, of questioning. Let us give to make an impact in these places, to build your kingdom right where we are. God of love and compassion, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus, who came and dwelt among us, showing us how to love one another and to care for all people. Help us to seek to help others as Jesus did by asking their true needs and not assuming we already know what they need. Multiply these offerings for use in bringing forth the kingdom of God on earth. Grant us wisdom. God creates, knows, loves, and sees all of us in our full humanity. But as people, we can fall into the habit of assuming everyone is the same or everyone is like us. While we share a common humanity, these assumptions can be harmful and prevent us from truly seeing other people and listening to their perspectives. By looking at biblical stories, this series will help us learn how to listen to, respect, affirm, and act for and with others. In doing so, we can also come to know God even more fully. I see you. We are so glad that we were able to offer our first outdoor in-person worship service for Easter. The return team will continue to plan for our next outdoor gathering and discern the path back to worship in our sanctuary. If you attended last Sunday, we welcome your feedback and your suggestions on how we can make the next gathering even better. Thank you for your patience, church family, and I can't wait to see you again. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who donated to the Easter and or Super Bowl collections. Because of your generosity, we were able to help 20 families with both Easter care packages and ShopRite gift cards. The families greatly appreciate all the help we have given them, especially during this difficult season. May God continue to bless you and thank you once again to all of you from our missions team. 
I'd also like to remind you that small groups are still going strong, and I invite you to get in on this good thing. Don't do this pandemic or this Christian walk alone. Join your sisters and your brothers in faith for friendship, fellowship, and fun. Please contact me at ronnell.cumc at gmail.com if you would like to join or start a group. And also, please join me before or following service for our combined coffee half hour. Come through at 930 for a quick chat, a cup of joe, and a catch-up session. I hope to see you there. You may also join us in prayer on Wednesday evenings on Facebook Live at 7 p.m., where we pray for those we love and for our world. If you have not done so already, please like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube and Vimeo channels. And now for our charge and final blessing. Let your life be a sign of Christ's life so that others may come to believe that the Lord is risen indeed. And may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. And as always, stay safe, stay strong, and stay in love with God and your neighbor. Have a blessed week. Ah. Uh -huh.